Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Science, Technology, and Society class. I'm Kenneth Fori, your instructor for this course. Okay, welcome to our students from the Georgie Elagan International Schools. Welcome to this recorded session for our asynchronous week for this course, Science, Technology, and Society, or SDS. Okay, hope you've been able to take your examination, your midterm examination uh, last week. So, um, grades will be published once I be able to complete the checking of your papers. Okay, so this week we'll be um, ending probably one of the modules that we're currently uh, into, which is the third module, which is the, uh, the topic when technology and humanity cross. Now, we are discussing still with robotics, artificial intelligence, the, the impacts of technology uh, into the human society. So this time we are uh, focusing on how artificial intelligence can affect us as humans. And we'll be discussing that through this uh, video lecture. So, this is our topic, why the future doesn't need us. And the subtopic, which is all about super intelligent machines. You know, guys, we want to think of how technology, uh, specifically artificial intelligence, robotics, and other smart technologies can really affect at the humanity level, no, at the level of humans, on our interactions, on our morals, on our ethics, on how we do life, or how we do our profession, it can really affect us. And I, we want you to reflect on these things that I'll be discussing throughout this video. Um, still, we're still in this module, why uh, on the why technology and humanity cross on uh, basically we also uh, will focus on the effects of the interplay between technology and the humanity particularly uh, artificial intelligence or ai so in this video i'll be tackling some aspects that his, some historical precedents of ai or artificial intelligence the impacts of artificial intelligence and the key people responsible on the discussion of artificial intelligence and its impact on the society. So in this particular presentation I'll be showing to you, we'll discuss about the super intelligent machines, the beginnings of artificial intelligence or AI, this thing called technological singularity, where we stand today, some notable predictions about the future of AI and moral or ethical implications of developing intelligent machines or basically AI, no? So before we will proceed further, I want you to check the video on your Microsoft Teams account, this YouTube video, what if we created a super intelligence? I hope you have checked that on your Microsoft Teams account. It's on the module number three channel. So please check on that. So if you have time um, after this lecture, watch this video and let, us, let me know what you think. No? Okay, so again, don't forget guys, uh, for those who are just watching us live on YouTube, please type in your name in the chat box for attendance purposes. Okay, let's discuss this thing called AI or artificial intelligence. It has been the subject of a lot of movies, a lot of the recent news, and even with the recent gadgets we are using, they now use this so-called AI, like for example, AI cameras for smartphones, AI, um, AI predictions of who this face is or who, what are these things are, no? 
AI about um, AI calling, what, what they call that, or AI battery management of your gadgets. Now, there, there are lots of AI going on. And even these uh, virtual assistants like Siri, the Google Assistant, Alexa, Cortana, that lang yan is under the domain of artificial intelligence. So let's discuss this now. Um, one of the uh, beginnings or one of the first innovations of artificial intelligence is this so-called machine called Deep Blue. It was developed in 1997 by International Business Machines or IBM. This particular robot or this particular like program or AI, whatever you want to call it, it was a, a chess playing machine that was able to beat the reigning world chess champion in that time. Deep Blue was a successor to a, another project of IBM called Deep Thought. And at that time, it was the 259th fastest supercomputer. And it can uh, move in terms, of, uh, in terms of chess playing around 200 million positions per second. That's fast in that time. But then Deep Blue was a less than intelligent thing or less than intelligent na machine because it uh, it implemented a so-called brute force algorithm. Parang you um, exhaust all possibilities until you find the right answer. That's actually what you see now in like um, uh, programs that hack passwords or programs that... Um, tries to uh, say overflow the memory of your computer or something like that. It's, it implements a so-called brute force algorithm. And what that is what how Deep Blue works as this chess playing machine. But then as technology goes, goes deeper or goes uh, higher fervor in terms of advancements, um, some prominent figures in the technology industry and computer scientists believe that there will be so-called computers with brains. Um, based on studies, the human brain can process up to 15 to 25 approximate beta flats of data. Flops means in uh, computer science terms, flops is like the, the millions of operations per second that, ca that can be processed in your brain in that particular machine. No? Again, the brain is basically functions like the machine. It can process that much data no? through the different senses we have. And as we can see now, no, one of the AI machines developed by IBM is the Sequoia with 16.3 petaflops of data. That particular supercomputer has 1.57 million cores in terms of CPU power, CPU operations. It has 1.57 million processing cores. That's a lot. And in terms of memory or the random access memory, it has 1.6 petabytes memory or storage. No petabytes. That's petabytes is after terabyte. No, 1,000 terabytes is one petabyte. Remember, one terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. How much more? No, we have already hard drives that are measured one to two terabytes. That's a little. That's so small compared to petabytes. That's a lot. Yeah. So imagine that these supercomputers today function as they are now. Here I'm showing you a chart about the exponential growth of computing from the start of the 20th century up to the 20th cent the 21st century now. And 
as you can see, the sequoia developed in the 2020s, it's right there. It can be able, it is be able, it is able to process information that is capable or is similar or uh, more than the capacity of the human brain. Imagine that. The, the, the development of information has um, information technology has really surpassed in the last 20 years or so. And you as students must realize that in the future, maybe 20 years from now, 10 years from now, or five years from now, many of our computing devices we become more powerful than ever before. Imagine that. And that worries a lot of people because in the long run, the computers that we have today will be able to process the information of all human brains in existence. And imagine that, how it, can store or process or retrieve information from all the human brains on earth. And we're basically creating a one super intelligent computer. Would we allow this to happen? Okay, that's something you have to think about. Uh, if you watch that video I attached earlier today in your MS Teams channel, you, you will see a lot of these uh, prominent figures in technology like Elon Musk, um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, um, Bill Gates of Microsoft. They were able to like send out warnings somehow, especially Elon Musk, that he wanted to slow down the development of technology that, that to a point that it can overcome the human brain, the human capacity. It can really affect, I, I don't know. It, it, it is a reality that must be talked upon no? or discussed upon before the turn of the 22nd century, 2100. No? Paano kaya yan? No? Let's go to, to this I know, to this slide. There's a thing called technological singularity. Um, this is uh, defined as the hypothetical figure or future of the emergence of greater than human superintelligence through technological means. And an intellectual event horizon is on the, on the rise. And in 2012, there was a singularity summit that happened in, in the US. No, um, it was the sixth annual that discussed the topic of technological singularity, the possibility of this particular supercomputer that can overcome or overpass the capacity or can measure a lot more than what humans can do that can have feelings or so or maybe or produce emotions produce these thoughts produce these opinions by itself as a machine that is that is why this emergence of this particular phenomenon has worried a lot of tech in, uh, tech giants and even prominent figures in the tech industry and even computer scientists in these academic institutions. It's an inevitability. And somehow this trend of the emergence of super intelligent machines has some roadblocks at some point. There are still hindrances or challenges in developing these super intelligent machines. 
the first thing is the limited understanding of how the human brain works. So if we go through the concept of biology, people or even the biologists or anatomists or those who practice anatomy or even the medical fields cannot still determine, still cannot determine how really the human brain works. Like from the conception of the fetus, how come the brain is already functioning at that point when the, the, the baby is still a fetus in the mother's womb, th that particular part of the body, which is called the brain, how this, does, it, it, does it already work? Na gumagalaw na yung bata sa tiyan ng nanay, di ba? There's still a limited understanding. No? Even, even as adults how there are still limited studies on how how the brain processes certain emotions or how the, the brain can process language for example or how the brain can detect these um, detect these senses from your eyes from the different senses sight smell touch hearing and oh no, and taste no Dami pang mga kailangan pang malaman about the human brain. Another memories or how does how the brain uh, gets affected by certain diseases. There's there there are also those things. There's a limited understanding. And how how can we how can these medical professions treat these studies? Wala pa rin. No? And that affects those who are developing these super intelligent machines. Hindi pa rin nila na maiintindihan paano kaya, ano kaya ang ginagawa ng isang human brain to process, say, for example, the context of a certain sentence being spoken by, by a certain person. No? No? Remember, language is not just like the syntax, how you express the words. There's still like how you... In what is the intonation of your voice during that particular time you spoke that sentence or how what is your facial expression maraming ganun eh so hindi pa rin determine ng mga computer scientists in terms of AI how the brain works in terms of these things wala pa rin another thing about Another hindrance to develop super intelligent machines, the advancements of technology. There are a lot of barriers of the, in developing these technologies. One, one especially is morals or ethics. There are still ethical considerations in certain development of these technologies in AI, such as privacy and security. Would you want your personal information to be processed by this AI? Would you want your, say, your personal life, love life, sex life, your health, would you want your AI to control those? Those are ethical considerations. And that is a hindrance of these AI, super intelligent machines. These, advan these advancements could yeah, overcome those barriers, but again, there's a catch to it. As you may notice in recent years, no, there is an emergence also of nanotechnology. No, nano means like smaller than the width of the human hair, nanotubes, no, nanobots in research and development. This can potentially become medical breakthroughs, especially in treating diseases. Now, these nanobots can uh, be able to interact with your biological systems, for example, in animals, in humans, or even in plants. These nanobots can treat those at the cellular level, to be exact. And with nanotechnology, 
there's a potential use of these nanobots to be able to reverse engineer the brain at the cellular level. Again, how does the human brain work? Through the use of these nanobots, it will be able to determine the structures that build the human brain, unique as they are in individual humans. What if we can build the brain of a certain person? It can be possible through the use of nanotechnology. Okay, let me discuss some different prominent figures in artificial intelligence. One of which is American inventor and futurist Raymond Kurzweil. Kurzweil predicts that machines in the future will be more intelligent than humans. In his book, The Singularity is Real, he mentions technological singularity. And he predicted in the 2020s, nanobots will be used in the medical field. And actually, it's happening today in 2021 as I record this video. Nanobots, if you see the news, especially in the fight against COVID-19, nanobots are being used now to develop these vaccines. No? Nanobots are also being used to determine how the COVID-19 virus is being uh, it's affecting rather the different organs, especially the respiratory system. Nanobots are being used to investigate those, those causes. I'm just mentioning the 2020s. How about in 2029? He is predicting that there will be a there will be the first computer that will pass the Turing test. What is the Turing test? The Turing test is uh, in computer science terms. Now, this is a test wherein if you are a human or not. Remember, humans can determine such uh, different patterns compared to these computers, like text or pictures. What is this picture? You know, describe descriptions of pictures or codes, numbers, all of that. No, but later on, in the late 2020s, he predicts that there will be a computer that will pass the Turing test. And a lot of computer scientists are afraid of that, actually. Now, maybe a computer or a robot will be able to like hack every single um, social media account just by, just by passing the CAPTCHA you know, or a, a form of a Turing test. And that worries a lot of security experts. And then in 2045, in the 2040s, he also predicts that the, the, the thing called technological singularity will be a thing. And in, this, in that particular book, you would be able to think that are these things happening today? Or are we seeing the predictions of Raymond Kurzweil be able to happen in the nearest future, not just in the 2020s. Like it can happen this, say for example, the first computer that will pass a Turing test will happen like in 2022 or even in 2021, you know, earlier than that. I don't know. Even the singularity, it may, could it happen in the 2030s, not in the 2040s? Who else can guess that? No? But it is happening. The, that eventuality is already there. Another person uh, involved in the development or in the discussion of artificial intelligence is the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, Bill Joy. So Sun Microsystems is a corporation that is behind the, program, the Java programming language, MySQL, the database uh, programming language also. Uh, now Sign Microsystems is now part of Oracle. No? Just to let you know, no, if, if you're not into the IT field. No. Okay, so he wrote his book, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. And 
he discussed these different things about technology. The possible dangers of the increasing advancement of technologies like genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics. He is he has been arguing about this for so long before even before when he was the founder of Sun Microsystems, he was be able to like figure out based on his development on the company's development of the Java programming language that it would be used like for for communications. And today, as you may notice, Android, which which is which in which its code is actually based on Java, which is under uh, which was made by Sun Microsystems. No, it has become the like the the lingua franca of all smartphones, um, outside of Apple. No, which has a different coding. No, he argues. Bill Joy argues that. Machines later on, in the future, will become smarter. Just think of all these in artificial intelligence platforms we have right now. And through that, AI, the machines, will create a dystopia. A so-called bad future, dystopian future, wherein machines now lead humans. And that worries a lot of people. I'm just um, giving you some fair warnings about our discussion today. I'm not, I'm not inciting your fear, especially those who are watching us live on YouTube. No, it can and it can happen, and it will happen. It's only a matter of time. Now, let me discuss the existential risk of how the future will become a, a more artificially intelligent society. People would argue that the first super intelligent machine would become programmed by error pro humans. Yes, humans are prone to errors, prone to mistakes. We make mistakes. And Machines are not an exception. According to Dick Bostrom of his book, Existential Risks, he tells that, quote, we tell it to solve a mathematical problem and it complies by turning all the matter in the solar system into a giant calculating device. In the process, killing the person who asked the question. It's gonna be tough when the future of technology would rise and it could affect the way we live in. Could it be that you as tourism and hospitality students, once these machines get more intelligent and more intelligent, would it be able to control your way of doing your practice as tourism and hospitality professionals? What if Again, I put I gave you that argument last week. Would robots replace humans? Again, we don't know, but it may happen. It will happen, and it can happen. Like, say, robots will replace servers in the restaurant because again, we live in these times of COVID nineteen, less less human contact, and will be probably will be having robot servers in the future in restaurants or a robot will do your food delivery a robot will be your tour guide a robot will be your flight attendant a robot will be your travel agent a robot will be your chef a robot will be your cruise ship attendant an, uh, an artificial intelligence assistant will book your flights. It's a possibility, guys. Everything, but there is a risk to that. There is a risk. And it can affect us.
I'm posing this question to you now, guys. Kasi, again, in the future, we will see robots doing their thing. Maybe replacing your profession. If mach- machines would think and act like a human, would you want them to consider that you would consider them to be humans? Will it be moral to give machines human values and emotions? If a super intelligent robot committed a crime, is the programmer to blame? Um, if you want to watch like a, like a video game, there is a video game uh, I want to mention, Detroit Become Human. It's a video game about ro- robots, uh, androids, you know, human-like robots that function like humans. No? Would you want these machines, na they look human, they act like humans, would you give them the, the, the right that they are humans too? That's a very deep, very controversial question to ask. I don't know with you, but that's how I... That's how I wanted to do. Oh gosh. You know, that's a if I mention it here, it's gonna be controversial. Very, very controversial. Again, again. While we see these robots or human intelligence or artificial intelligence become dominant in the future, we should also appreciate that there is also a morally sound artificial intelligence. There are artificial intelligence projects that can help us live our lives better or more efficiently. No, These are those morally sound AI. And these AI technologies are those that can overcome disease, study genetics, and overcome famine with the use of technology. There are AI projects that are being in development right now that, again, for example, the AI projects that are now responsible for developing vaccines against the COVID-19 pandemic, AI that now is determining the genetics of different pathogens, AI that is responsible on um, calculating the, the, the ways to reduce famine as part of the UN's um, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, if you, if you are familiar with that. AI is being developed to reduce famine, reduce hunger, through the use of the supply chain and AI. No? that's the morally sound AI. And we should comment on that. No? So to end this discussion, no, there, is, there is artificial intelligence already, but not yet on that level that can um, surpass the human brain. But we can already see this fury of technological singularity and the development of nanoscience, nanotechnology that can affect the way we do things. And we have heard, we have seen the risk of super intelligent machines, morally, ethically, economically, every aspect of life, it can affect this AI and robots can really affect us later on and we must put some moral boundaries on that ethical boundaries on those and we now see amongst all of these ai there is morally sound ai that solve different human problems and we must comment on that the future doesn't need us because we will we are bound to die and we have to realize that 
these robots in the future, these machines, maybe will help us, but could be, could they destroy us? We don't know that. No one knows for sure. So that ends this discussion on the, the topic, why the future doesn't need us. These are the sources if you want to uh, take on that, if you want to read some of these uh, references. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so let's do some discussion, online discussion. Does artificial intelligence benefit or disrupt our way of living? If you want to answer this question as, as extra points to your quiz, comment in the comment section below. Please comment if you want to answer this. Um, let me know what you think of this question. Will AI, does AI benefit or disrupt our way of living? Is it this beneficial or is it disruptive? Let me know in the comment section below. So this is where I will announce the final requirement for SDS for this term, a mini documentary of science and technology issues. I'm now announcing this ahead of time so you can prepare and think about what you will do for this particular project. The objectives for this project is to present a show on the science and technology issues that impact tourism and hospitality. So, Again, this is like a video. This is a video project that you will work on by the end of this term. Para naman at least may idea tayo or we can show to everyone how science and technology can impact your specific field. So originally, if you, if you remember my first meeting with you, this assignment was supposed to be like a talk show. But because like, COVID happened, so we'll change this to a mini documentary format. But again, it can be like a talk show also if you want interviews or like that. No, you can choose to tell an original story in either media format, any format you want to choose, as long as it is interesting. Okay? That's interesting na topics about science and technology that affects tourism and hospitality. Okay, so I want you to divide yourselves in this class, uh, groups of five to six students, preferably of the same degree program. Say if you are BSITM, BSITM kayo. The, or if you are BSIHM, BSIHM dapat tanan. No? So each group will choose a topic of their liking. And groupings... Um, I'll be posting a post on MS Teams or groupings for final project. Please send your groupings. You'll, you can group on your own. no. But as long as you'll send your groupings, basta five to six students through Microsoft Teams. Okay? Yan lang. Okay? So what are the topics you can uh, do for your mini documentary? Um, first is virtual reality in tourism, VR especially in the pandemic, how can we still go to tourism establishments or tourism, hot, uh, tourism destinations or tourism attractions without ever leaving the house? AI and robots in hospitality. One particular also topic right now is the studies on scent marketing and hospitality. Have you ever realized when you go to a certain hotel, there is a certain scent? And why is it, uh, if you go to like Shopee Lazada, there is this like so-called humidifiers that, uh, or scents for humidifiers or diffusers that resemble the scents of certain hotels. Why is it there is this scent marketing? There are a lot of studies about scent marketing in hotels, hospitality, resorts, all of that. You can check on those uh, studies. Uh, you can also discuss hygiene practices during the COVID-19 pandemic. Why is it a lot of people now are so obsessed with cleaning during COVID-19? Why are people so obsessed with washing hands? 
and all of these cleaning products. What's the what's the what's the gist? You can also discuss food safety at home, especially for hospitality students or culinary students. No, you can discuss food safety. The science behind food, it's also a good thing to discuss. Virtual events post pandemic. How do we are, can do a, like a the scientific discussion on how will events become virtual after this pandemic is over? You can also talk about Filipino science, science innovators in tourism and hospitality. You can research on that and discuss for your videos. No? So what are the instructions that you will do when you're making your video? Okay, so you have to uh, limit your video between three to five minutes. No more, no less. If you watch these videos on YouTube like Vox or Discovery Channel or Not Geo, most of their like videos, short videos are like three to five minutes long discussing certain topics, certain parts of their programs. Ganun lang dapat ang length. So I want you to limit yourself limit your videos to three to five minutes as long as parang the topic's very interesting, very siksik dapat yung content. So remember, it needs to have an introduction, body, and conclusion. No, no abrupt beginnings or endings with no explanation, guys. Please, uh, ano na tayo, college students na tayo. Hindi na tayo high school na pwede tayo mag, we do what we want. No, this is serious. This is something we should share also to the world, no? We should share also to our to our fellow students on how do we discuss science and technology. Okay, here's a good part. You no, know, if you want really to incorporate this in your videos, uh, you can also do some interviews or some discussions with science experts. If you who may kakilala kayo or student friends who are science majors, for example, biology. Uh, computer science, information technology, um, medical technology, ano pa, uh, chemistry, mga ganun science majors. No? no? They are welcome, but they're not required. No? If you, if you want to incorporate interviews, that's fine. But if you want to really do those interviews, please follow minimum health protocols, please. Para hindi tayo ma technical na mga people who will be watching our videos. Okay? So, I suggest you do it virtually if you want an interview like that. Record your videos on Zoom. Kung pwede. Okay? Just follow minimum health protocols. If you really want to do like physical, again, physical distancing, face mask, face shield, mga ganun na bagay. Okay, technical details of your video. Uh, the resolution of your video must be in a minimum of 720p and a maximum of 1080p resolution. Alam nyo na yung ano, dimensions ng 720p at saka 1080p. Um, preferably, 60% of your video is borrowed footage or images and 40% original footage na individually shot. Yung kanang, yung tipong ano, yung tipong yung mga spills or yung mga original na footage, yung mga kuha ninyo talaga or yung interviews ninyo, 40% should be that, original footage. For your borrowed footage or pictures, it must have citations placed in a conspicuous place in the video. Somewhere below or above the video, dapat may source doon sa uh, binaraw nyo na video para hindi tayo makopyright strike. Okay, sound is really critical when you're proud of your project, no? Please, 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 ayusin niyo ang sound. Um, um, it's important in creating a documentary, especially when you're doing like videos like this. Make sure that your video has good quality sound, okay? That is important when you're creating videos like this, huh? Okay. So those are some of the instructions. If you have any questions, let me know. So your project is due by 5 p.m. on the last day of the final exam week. So I'll, I'll, I'll post the assignment uh, later on once I check the calendar kung kailan tayo matatapos. So after this, uh, once you're complete, please upload the file of your completed project from Microsoft Teams. So I'll expect the video to be 
ano, submitted by one of your representatives. So, again, pack one, pack all ito ha. So, the scoring, the rubrics of your documentary project, uh, this is 20 points of your grade. So, um, the rubrics will be divided into four content, organization, video editing, and technical aspects. So, each of these is five points each. So, please, 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 please work on it. No, um, para um, the performance must be like clear, talaga yung content. The organization is effective. The video is very smooth. The technical aspects are there. I would really appreciate a, a very uh, effective documentary, not necessarily na talaga mata, mataas ang production value, basta the content of that video is very informative, very interesting, and really relates to science and technology that impacts your field of study. No? Kayo mga tourism, hospitality, culinary students. Importante na dapat alam nyo yung ginagawa ninyo, ano yung dinidiscuss ninyo sa mga videos ninyo. Okay? So that is what I require of you by the end of this term. Okay? So if you have any questions about your final project, just let me know. So anyway, I'll post those details on MS Teams uh, later this week. So next meeting for your uh, Science Technology and Society, I'll be now starting with module number four, the information age. So I'll be discussing how information technology, especially, and the emergence of these different information platforms, like your libraries, your journals, scientific journals, these things can affect your study of science. Okay, so that will be your uh, lesson for the next asynchronous video session. So that ends my video lecture for science, technology, and society. I hope you're able to enjoy this video, this discussion. If you're not yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, subscribe button is the key. If you're not yet updated with my latest videos, please also click that bell button beside it. And if you like this video, like, please like that, uh, press that like button so that we can help the YouTube algorithm. And maybe you want to share to your fellow students about science, technology, and society. Why not share this also to your friends? So thank you so much, everyone from the Georgie Ilagan International Schools. I'm Sir Kenneth Porio. Thank you, and we'll see you on the next lecture. Bye-bye and God bless.